Welcome to Five Easy Ways to Get Your Performance to the Next Level. I'm Count William of Fairhaven from the Middle Kingdom. I've been in the SCA since 81, Squire in 88, Knighted in 94, Pelican in 95, Court Baron in 2009, and I was King of the Middle Kingdom with my lovely lady in 2017. And uh, I'm a lifetime musician. I've been playing music my whole life, and I got involved in guitar for the SCA about 1989. I have a band in the real world because I just don't have enough to while away the empty hours. And I quit tracking what we were doing as a band when we passed 500 live paid performances. So uh, I want this class to be interactive. If you're not speaking, please keep yourselves muted. But if you have a question, you can also in the chat off to the right, you can, uh, if you open up the chat, there's a little thing to raise hand. I can't see everybody, but I can kind of scroll around in there. Um, but feel free to use your microphones. I want this to be interactive. I've spent a lot of time playing music in the SCA. My band spent many years busking at the Ohio Renaissance Festival. We were very successful at that. And the reason I created this class is performance is the most overlooked piece of a bard's repertoire from what I have seen. And I've traveled, I've been to most of the kingdoms in the continental US. I've taken my band to Ireland twice and to Scotland once, and we've played gigs there out of the blue for public. And what I have noticed is that an awful lot of folks don't think about it. It's not that they don't, they, they don't even know it's there. They don't really know what the performance piece is. And the performance piece is that it's that piece anybody could improve on, regardless of your skill as a bard. I like energetic, enthusiastic performance far more than people who are perfect in their execution and zero energy. Energy counts for a lot in the game of bardic performance. So basically, I'm going to break this class down into it. So here's a couple. Here's my three. Here's William's three big rules of performing. You have to earn your audience every single time. I don't care who you are. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how many times you've played a place. As soon as you are not trying to earn your audience, you are failing. And so you have to go out there and earn the audience every show. That means you have to give it 100% every time. And, you know, I get it. Maybe you're playing and you don't feel the best. We all have things that happen in our lives. But, man, for that five minutes you play that song on stage or performing for one person, ten people, a hundred people, I think the largest crowd we've played for is probably somewhere in the twelve to 1,500. you got to own that space when you're playing. The root of that is something we in Fintan say. It's a pleasure to play for fans. It's a privilege to play for friends. Your friends typically represent your core audience who are going to support you and you need to work twice as hard for them. If you do that, everybody else is going to feel it in a good way. That is super important. You never take any audience for granted and you sure as heck cannot take your core audience for granted. The folks who hear you a lot. And last, you've got to have fun doing this. If it is painful, miserable, maybe Bardic's not for you, or it may be it's something you need to work through. And I take my guitar to every event I go to. Sometimes I never take it out. Sometimes I sit in a corner and play for nobody. Sometimes I generate a crowd. If I've got any of my Bardic Storm buddies, we can collect a crowd very quickly. But I always bring it. And I brought it when I was king. And I, I did Bardic while I was king and while I was prince. You have to make it a priority in your life to work on your music, and it's a craft. All right, so that's, that's the basics. I wanna add something that's not in there. So when I first started Bardic and playing, really playing for people in 1989, beyond the fact that I was terrible, I didn't have to compete with anything. And today, the number one thing that you bards have to compete with is this. 
I have sat in a bar gig where we played for three hours out of four and watched people come in, sit, order food, drink, and never look up from their friggin' phones. Your goal as a bard is to get somebody to put this frickin' thing down long enough to hear you. And if you can get people to look up from your phone, no matter what you're doing, singing, instruments, juggling, I don't care, you're winning. That's my metric of success right there. And so you have to, you have to work on these things because the phone is like a drug. So how do we do that? Love you, bye. Whoever's got that noise in the background, could you mute, please? Thanks. All right. So number one, first and foremost, if you haven't seen my handout, it is available in the SCA Bardic Arts Files Forum, and it's also available in the RUM Forum, I'm pretty sure. Um, so the first and most annoying thing that I see an awful lot of bards doing is apologizing ahead of time for how terrible their performance is going to be. Just stop it. Just stop it. It's not self-effacing. It's not modesty. It's just a turnoff to your audience. And it's probably not really true. I have seen some bad performers and I know because I was one of them. Uh, I, I started playing, playing for people because I had a guitar and I was terrible. But energy, a big smile, some enthusiasm go a long way. Don't spend a bunch of time apologizing for what you're going to perform. Bisbee, is there a question? You popped on my video. Oh, I'm sorry. That's because I just got back here. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, so quit apologizing for your song. Just stop doing it. One of the things that you need to learn as a bard, so as a band, we define our set list by songs that we call crush pieces. A crush piece is a song that you could play with a Jedi Star Wars blaster helmet covering your face and earplugs in, and you would still sound good. You know this song frontwards and backwards. You can play it in your sleep. You can play it by muscle memory. I played at the Green Dragon when I was Prince down at Gulf Wars, and I wasn't prepared to play someplace where the room doesn't give you any return. So I was singing into the void, and I couldn't hear myself. I could hear my vocals through bone induction, but I couldn't hear my guitar that I'm holding in my hands playing. I did my whole set that way. People went crazy. They thought I was awesome. I thought it was the worst performance of my life because I couldn't gauge anything. You can't see the audience and you can't hear yourself. So, but I played pieces that I can absolutely hammer every single time. And that is super important. Pick a song. You should have a list of three. Your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice. And I'll explain more about that. You should have a song. If somebody asks you to play, you can play it in any circumstance. Stand up in front of court. I've played in front of numerous courts at the request of the royalty while they were doing something and they needed somebody to do something for three and a half minutes. Hey, I'm your guy. And then you're done. Other times, if you're camp walking at places like Gulf Wars or Out West, Western War, Estrella, Penzik, and somebody says, hey, play us a song. You have a song that you can play right now. You just step up and you belt it out and you crush it. And if the audience really likes you and they really make a show of asking you, you, will play, you can play a second song. If that goes well and they're begging you for a third song, you should have another song ready. You play three songs and you are done. Just, it, especially if you want to play multiple places, play your three songs and say thank you so much and move on. It's always better to leave the audience wanting you to play more than it is to just like GTFO, you know? And sometimes it's one song and you have to be ready for that. And don't compare yourself to other bards in that circumstance. So I'm not apologizing because I'm not as good as, oh, I don't know, uh, Heather Dale, I suppose. Her stuff's great, it's very well produced, you know? There are great bards all over the SCA. It's not a competition. You're not competing with anybody but yourself. Are you better than you were the last time you played? You got to put in the time. Don't compare yourself to other bards and don't worry about it. Especially if you're going to take one of their songs and make it your song. Because the other thing is, is there are a whole lot of, of, of lady bards and I love their stuff. But when I sing it, it's not going to sound like them because I'm a guy. And that's that. 
you want to make those songs your own. And even songs sung, you know, Master Moonwolf, who is very famous outside of the SCA and in, in the SCA, taught me a bunch of songs, and I play them a little different than him. And when we get together, we play them together, and we have a lot of fun. It's not a competition. Don't put yourself in that place. Have a song that's ready. Have a one-liner about it. The first song I ever learned was Step It Out, Mary by Danny Doyle. I must have practiced it 500 times before I ever went out and played it. And I picked it up off of a cassette from Pegasus Music back in the 80s. And Danny Doyle is like this was this very big songwriter in Ireland. And so I just comment that. Hey, Danny, that's a song by Danny Doyle, an excellent songwriter from Ireland. It's called Step It Out, Mary. And play the song. All right. You have to learn to pay attention to your audience. I cannot stress this enough. This is the big failing I see of bards. We have a lot of captive audiences in the SCA where people cannot leave. <laughs> And they're awfully nice and they're not going to tell you you suck or you annoy them or you're terrible. You have to be introspective enough to watch. I mean, if your thing is Vogon poetry put to music and you're killing the audience, you better have something that's not Vogon poetry put to music to catch the crowd back. I mean, constantly singing doom and gloom death ballads may be your idiom, but let me tell you, you will typically get a lot more from your audience if you can play a rip and sailor song or a shanty. And I know that those aren't period. I don't play any, I probably know a handful of period songs. Mostly I play Irish pub students. They're easy. They're a good thing to cut your teeth on, good thing to learn from. Almost everybody knows them and you can join in easy, get people to sing with you. All right. So you got to learn to look at the audience. And I know that it is tough because if I look into somebody's eyes, I can get lost there and forget what I'm doing. So my first piece of advice is learn to look at the space right between their eyes above the forehead and scan the crowd. Are people paying attention? Are they, are our feet tapping? Are they looking up from their phones? You know, if you were losing an audience, change tunes to get something with more energy, you know? And if you're holding an audience, stick with it. But you can't keep the audience up here the whole time. We could probably do a whole separate conversation about writing set lists, tempoing sets. If you're going to record, how do you build albums, your starter, your closer, your middle anchor, and all the pieces between. My wife and I do this every week on our, or we've got a, we've got a Facebook live stream on Wednesday nights on my Facebook page where we play six or seven songs, all genres. We take requests and we put them together for sets, but we build out a set list. That's the thing you got to learn to do. What am I starting with? should be strong. What am I ending with? Should be really strong. What's in the middle? Should be moderate compared to your ends, etc. You also need to have songs that are different lengths and different keys. And you need to pay attention. If, if, you're, if your audience seems, you know, and this is my horse tamer's daughter kind of thing. Nobody in the modern world is going to sit there for you for 15 minutes to play a song like that. They're not going to sit there for me. They're not going to sit there for the best part. They're going to just lose interest. Big, long story songs that take a long time to play. Unless they're coming to see you in a concert. Now, if they're coming to see you in a concert, Lorena McKenna does The Highwayman, and that thing's 11 minutes long. One of my favorite songs. Am I going to do The Highwayman? No, I'm going to lose the audience. They're going to go right off the rails. They're just, they're gone. So three to four minute songs, four and a half, if you're strong, you can carry a five, five and a half minute song if you're strong. But I recommend learning some easy songs, especially tunes from the 60s, as songs to develop your skill because they're short, they catch the audience long enough for you to listen, and you're done. Let's see. If you're playing with other people, this is a cardinal sin. I, I, I see so many bards that don't read cues. They stomp all over the other people around them and they have no barking clue what's going on. Reading cues is a bardic skill around performance. And I will tell you that it has to be learned. I had the occasion to go to Ireland with the fiddler for Gaelic Storm. Uh, Bob Banerjee lives in Pittsburgh. He played with them for about two years. He's one of the best fiddlers I know. The guy's amazing. And I sat in on some of the jams and he kept trying to do something to cue me. And after one of the shows, and I had had the band 
four years at that point. And I'd been playing for eight, nine years. And we kind of come out, and it was just a throw together in an Irish pub with no particular format. And the guy just rips me. He's like, Jesus, what the hell are you doing? Can't you tell I'm trying to give you the beat? You're running all over me. And he just tore me up. And I was like a little, okay, it's your show. It's your tour. Put my guitar away for the whole rest of that trip. Did not get it back out. Saw him later. And he invited me to come and play music with him in Pittsburgh. So I went. We had a great time. And I commented because it stuck with me. And I started paying a lot more attention to the musicians around me. And in a band or in any ensemble group, that is super important. So I thanked him and he was like, oh, geez, I must have sounded like a total dick. But he had been in a country and Western band. So if the Bob Banerjee is, is Indian and he is very Indian. He's a really fun guy. He has an Irish band called Corn Beef and Curry. So you can check them out. They're fantastic. And he's like, he was in a country band and he was playing all over the place. And the lead, the lead leader of the band basically took him aside and ripped him up and down saying, I'll point to you when it's your turn to play. You know, you're running all over all the other performers up here. You're just playing your fiddle all the time. So you got to develop some self-awareness. It's really important and it will give you a happier bard life. And sometimes you just sit and listen. It's not required. If somebody else is playing, maybe ask, do you mind if I join you? Or is this your thing? One of the things that's really tough as bards is to learn to pay attention, when you spend all your time paying attention out here, is to just sit back and be a, be a, a, fan, a fan boy or a fan girl. So you can enjoy music and it's tough. You gotta balance that. Um, tune your instrument, <laughs> even if it's your voice. Now, for you pure singers out there, if you don't know what this is, go and get one. This is a chromatic pitch pipe. Learn to set a tone for your songs. And while voices sometimes, as they get more tired, you lose high and low range, this gives you a starting point. For you guitar players and string players and violin players, tuned instruments have more projection power. And if two of you are playing together, two guitars that are tuned, doubles. But as soon as there's any dissonance, you're killing the sound. Tune your instruments. These, uh, these little snark tuners are about 12 bucks, and they will tune any instrument. The whistle player, my band, clips it on his whistle. Get a tuner. Learn to listen and hear your instrument and your voice so you know if you're in tune or not. We all sing flat, we all sing sharp, but why make it any harder? Avail yourself of technology. That is super important. And that all goes to the paying attention. If my guitar is out, even in a song, I may finish the song, but if it's a song where I can touch tune, I'll step on my pedal and touch tune it, or I'll just leave my snark on the SCA and I'll just look over and fix that string if I've got some ensemble players. Nothing does better than having your instruments and your voices in tune and on notes. I mean, if you want to sing the song in F sharp, it's fine. But have a starting point that says, I know where F sharp is, and train yourself against that. Let's see. All right. All right. This is probably one of the most overlooked things that people really, really struggle with. Play music you enjoy. And the reason I want to tell you that is, so there's a guy in the SCA here in Central Ohio where I live, phenomenal guitar player. He had a real band out in the real world, and they paid all their bills doing full-time music. They were a cover band. They were very successful in the, I don't know, early to mid-90s. They were called Asphalt Daisy. They had their own offices. They had their own studio. Very successful. They played top 40 out of Rolling Stone. And they would play three sets, 51 songs, 17 songs a set, carefully constructed. They would play the same set both nights. They would, they would, they would take over a bar for a, week, a, a Friday night and a Saturday night. And they did that for six and a half years. And this guy walked away. And he wouldn't bring out his guitar in the SCA. This guy taught guitar at our local music store here in Fairborn, Ohio, where I live, at Absolute Music. And I couldn't, I, I, come on, man. Why don't you get your guitar out? 
And he said, you know, we made all that money. We played 51 songs a night and I hated 50 of them. And the 51st, I wasn't all that keen on. They never got to play their own stuff. They never got to, to do anything that they really wanted because they were driving on that, on the dollar signs. And if that's your job, that's a thing. I have a day job. Everybody in my band has a day job. We play music for fun. We can take whatever we want for pay or, or we can charge whatever we want if we can get it. But we play stuff we like and we've had places say, maybe you should learn some covers. No, just no. There's a hundred cover bands in Dayton and most of them pay to play. I'm not interested in competing that. We don't, we, we, we turn down more gigs than we play in a year because there simply isn't enough time. We would have played six gigs on St. Patty's day and the day and the, the Saturday before. And we turned down at least six, if not eight gigs, because there's just no more time. There's no more room to pick your stuff up and go place to place, et cetera. Play stuff you love. It will come through in your performance. If you, are, if you want to do a Beach Boys song and you do it really well, everybody's going to be okay with that in the right setting. At Penzik, you can kind of play whatever you want. Me and my Bardic Storm buddies, we go around playing Irish pub tunes, hits of the 60s and 70s, easy listening. We play Hotel California. We play Horse With No Name. Two-board song, by the way, super easy to learn. A little rhythmically challenging, but it's an easy song. But the point there is, is you got to understand, remember we said about reading your audience. At Pensick, you can play things that connect to the core of who we are as 20th century, 21st century humans. Everybody in that we, you will encounter, likely in the SCA, probably knows Horse With No Name. We played it at an enormous household gathering dinner for some friends. And it was our middle piece. We opened with Irish Rover. We played Horse With No Name in the middle. And we finished with Johnny Jumbo. And everybody from 16 to 70 was singing Horse With No Name. You got to get that connect. That's the part of this. That, and if you love that music, do some Donovan songs, whatever. But if you love it, that will come through in your performance. But if you don't like it, don't learn songs because somebody thinks you should learn songs. So, hey, I don't know any of them. I don't even know the titles. Virtually, I've probably never heard most of them. It's not what I listen to. My tastes are super eclectic. But when I'm out there playing, I'm all in, I'm trying to play things that will connect to the core. And while it might be cool, it, certainly I would never enter a horse with no name in an a &S, obviously. But trying to get a 14th century French piece out at a camp full of people who are drinking and trying to chill around a big campfire and, you know, in that setting of any large camping event, if I play Take It Easy by the Eagles, I will connect to those people in the way that that 14th century piece probably connected to those 14th century people. Pop music is popular, that's what it means. And there are tried and true song classics and if you work at them, really get them learned, they go just fine. I don't have to play, and I'm not gonna play anything I don't wanna play because I, if I have to invest energy in learning songs, I want them to be songs that I love. You know, work from there. I probably, yeah, and sing every song like it's yours. I'm never gonna carry Dewey Bunnell, who is the lead singer for America, I'm never going to carry his range. I'm just never going to quite get there. Probably almost none of us are going to carry a Stephen Stills range for something like Crosby, Stills, and Nash. It doesn't matter. Move the song into a key that works for you. I'll discuss that in a little bit, but you got to own it, and you gotta, you got to love it. If you don't, I have seen more people fail. And presence and energy. Learn to play standing up if you can. There are plenty of campfires where we've sat, but almost always I take my guitar strap and we stand up and play. It's better for your breathing. We could tell a whole thing about that. But you gotta own it. And energy and attitude count for more than technical skill. So I live right by the University of Dayton, which has one of the best music schools around here. A very, very good music school. So I used to go play at the open mic um, at a local coffee house just around the corner from where I lived. And you never know what you're gonna get at a coffee house. So one night this guy comes in 
He's one of the best looking men I've ever seen. He's got long hair and he's got the guitar case and he goes up there and he sits down. So the first thing is he sits down and he, he's not plugged in. He's not, no amplification, pulls out a classical guitar. That is a nylon string guitar. By its very nature, it's generally quieter than a steel stringed guitar instrument. And when I say guitars, I'm talking about any kind of a guitar bazooki. Ukuleles are kind of their own thing, and ukes are cool. And, and if you're looking for an instrument to learn, uke has got a, uh, a nice learning curve. Not, not, as, not as hard on you as guitar. But so he sits down and he says, yeah, I am Hans. I am a student at the University of Dayton, and I will play for you Chopin's Nocturne in E flat. And he drops his head and his hair comes down and he wails on this thing. His technical skill is, I'll never be that good no matter how much I practice. I started too late. And then when he was done, he got golf club applause. Thank you. I will now play Beethoven's fourth etude. And like, I just killed all the energy in the room. Just, in fact, it was the opposite. He sucked all the energy out of the room. If, if you're putting on a concert where people are coming to listen to that music, like a chamber concert, awesome. He would have killed it. But he was trying to play for a bunch of people, hopped up on caffeine in a coffee house, so full of smoke, you almost couldn't see the stage. The only thing that you're going to carry in there is your voice. So energy. Make sure you are playing from the heart. If you're not, you're going to struggle. You are. That's just how it goes. All right. This is a trick. A lot of people don't know. Practice all your material till you know it backwards and forwards, inside and out. You're dreaming about it, including the off the cuff, spontaneous stuff. Now you're all going to go like, what the hell is he talking about? All of the stuff you see that is spontaneous on stage has been ruthlessly practiced so that it looks like it's an off the cuff a joke, a move, a thing, it's been practiced. And you are never as clever as you think you are. Your lyric writing isn't as clever as you think it is. Your idea of ad-libbing things is you are not as good at it as you perceive in your head. Now, if you've been on whose line is it anyway, I bow to your ability to do completely off-the-cuff stuff. But for the rest of us mere mortals, practice your jokes if you're going to use any. Don't use too many. More than one joke in a set and you're a comedy act. If that's what you want to be, great. Most of the rest of us want to be music performers. But have a one-liner. You know, one of the ones that it's on the, it's in the end of my hand up. I, I always say if I learn a song, you know, and somebody will say, where'd you learn that? I said, oh, I learned it in, at my mother's knee or some other low joint. Some people will get that joke, some people won't, but it's a quick off the cuff that gives my brain, I can say it, and my brain can process whatever else I need to be doing without losing my place. You can have things like that, you know, um, and you have to practice them. And if you don't, you are surely not going to do them as well as you would like. Hi, Aggie. <laughs> so, and that's what the pros do. They work on the music relentlessly and ruthlessly. They, they work on it all the time. You know, if, if you imagine some of these guys touring around in buses to get from gig to gig. So I had occasion to sit with Gaelic Storm after a gig and, and shoot the breeze with those folks. I wanted Steve Twigger to show me some guitar stuff, and he took me up on stage after the show. We sat around. I got a chance to play guitar with Steve Twigger from Gaelic Storm for an hour. It was amazing. But we were talking, and I was talking with Pat Murphy, who is the front man to that band, and he said, I said, how much do you guys actually play? And he says, we do about 180 shows a year and another 100 days of nothing but travel. That's a lot of reps. What makes me a better bard than most people is that I just got a lot of reps. Bintan's had well over 500 performances, played 100 festivals, and we've been paid money for all of those. And house parties and weddings and you name it. Those guys get... That many, they get, they get in two years, they would have almost as many gigs as, as my band has gotten in 18. The more time you can put into practicing your material, the tighter and sharper it sounds. And it'll also help to quiet that voice in the back of your brain that says you suck. You don't suck. 
or maybe you do suck. I know I suck. And that's the nature of learning a thing. But if you get out there and give the thing that makes the SCA such a wonderful place is if you give it 100%, people read that, even if you're not perfect. You know, and the reason you practice and build your set list is nobody remembers the first song of your set list. They remember the last song of your set list. So the strongest song you know should be your finisher. And you should eventually then fan that out, have a group of finishing songs. So as you go camp to camp, you're not just playing the same three songs. When we did the Ren Fair, all the acts there played the same six songs in every half hour and they never changed. We played six different songs six times during the day and maybe we kept one of those finishers, but we played an almost entirely different set every day because we knew enough music. Okay. Finish strong. No matter what happens, finish strong. No matter how bad you've screwed up. And the last thing you should ever do when you gunch a chord is make a big face and go, just keep playing. That's a skill. Play through. Seriously, you have got to play through and finish like you own the place. Uh, to, uh, Countess Tamara Di Ferenzi, who was the bass player, the original bass player in my band before she had to move, she and her husband moved for work down, down south, but she had been the queen of the Ohio Ren Fair for four years, and she said, smile like an NFL cheerleader. Big smile, big energy. Who knows what they're doing? I mean, even if, you, even if you're paying attention, could you tell if they've messed up a routine? No, because they're all, they project this enormous amount of energy. And if you look at bands that are really good, and you can watch, you go to live performances, and you can watch bands screw stuff up. We screw up stuff all the time live. We screw up songs we have played <laughs> thousands of times. Because sometimes you just screw something up. But learning to pass through that gate of being able to finish that song. I blew a word in the first, I, I missed, I left out a verse. I don't even know how many times I've sung something like Whiskey in the Jar. Once in a while we drop a verse. Or once in a while we don't remember what verse we're at and we sing the same verse a second time. Nobody cares. They don't. If they, if, if you're putting into that performance, that kind of energy and feel, it'll be okay. You know, the, hmm, it says my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, what else is new? There's now 80 billion people on the internet, right? Why shouldn't my internet connection mirror my life, right? Yeah, there we go. Anyways, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. The biggest hurdle you've got to overcome, you have to, so I'm going to just veer off philosophically here for a minute playing music in front of people is probably the most terrifying and scary thing you will ever do and it opens you up to the harshest kinds of criticisms that you're ever going to get in your life and all of that times a hundred if it's original material i've written stuff for the band i've written over 200 songs most people have never heard any of them i wrote them for me and I don't know that I care if I play them for anybody else. Or maybe I'm afraid to play them for other people. I don't know. I haven't decided. Being stuck in the house for another month or maybe two, I'm thinking that I might record these and create a YouTube channel of my original material and just see what happens. But you, are, you, you have to get past that as a bard. You've got to. You just have to get past that and start small. And... I have literally spent, I, I think we worked it out. I think I've spent 4,000 hours in gigs. I don't know, about 15, so yeah, 500 gigs, three to four hours a gig, 1,500 to 2,000 hours of actual playing on stage. Doesn't count. I probably have uh, at least that many, you know, 50, 18 years of practice a week, plus all my other, I mean, I probably have five, six, seven thousand hours of play time, of physical playing and singing time. And the thing that scared me the most and was the hardest to play for was my mom and dad moved away from Dayton before I formed the band. And they never got to see the band. And then my father had a stroke and he passed away. And my mom is now really not up to driving five hours to come to Dayton. 
So when we go visit, my wife and I took our uke and guitar and I worked up a set list to play for my mom. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done because of all things I did not want to do. I wanted it to be perfect. That's my mom. She's been my biggest cheerleader my whole life. So the first was really hard. Some of it was super emotional as I played some of those songs and dad was gone and on and on. And it's okay. There are songs that get me misty eyed when I play them and I try and learn to, I used to really try and tamp it down. And now I just don't worry about it. If some tears run out, then some tears run out. That's honesty. But get over yourself and get over your fears and get out and play. Seriously. Nothing is better than that because I can tell you when you hit it, we played some festivals where we had hundreds of people and we nailed our closer and the energy was crazy and everybody's clapping and screaming. And the, when you are done playing a gig, you should, you should need to sit down for an hour and power down because you should be high as a kite on just the natural energy of that experience. When I, when I, I'm the furthest away from where my band typically plays. So a lot of times I have an hour drive of 45 minutes home. And I come home and sit on the couch with a cup of decaf tea and I watch a movie. And I, at two in the morning, I'm sitting on the couch for half an hour because I, I can't go to bed. I can't hardly wipe the smile off my face. And then I got to just chill down. And so that's what you're shooting for. And a few things that I think are just important. And I'm, I, I, I asked for an hour and a half on this so that we could have a lot of Q&A if it's warranted. But I want to cover a few things that I think are really important to add into this. The audience owes you nothing, ever. And if you're, if you're, if you're a bard to, uh, and I don't want to come off sounding like a jerk, but if you're there because you've got some gaping hole that the applause of the audience fills for you and it's not genuine, just stop okay the audience doesn't owe you anything go back to what the first thing i said is earn the audience every time and the work you put into bardic performance will show and you will earn that audience and maybe you'll get a reputation maybe you'll be teaching a class for me at rum someday but you gotta you gotta go out with no expectation your bar needs to be set to zero we play in places where people have never heard us before you have to create your you have to in that club, at that wedding or whatever, turn into fans who will come back and see you again. And if you're doing that, you, you are winning. But you have to rep realize, we, we, used to, we used to play a gig, it's $1,000 for three hours, okay? We used to play this gig four or five times a year. It was in an old converted car garage, so it was 5,000 square feet of concrete floors, no tables, it had stand up, places where you could stand on the concrete and hold your beer and watch the 200 sports screens. And they paid us a thousand dollars to play for three hours and be utterly ignored. If our fans didn't come, we were playing into the void. And for a while we took that money. You say, Oh, I'm not going to pass that up. But it was affecting the band. We weren't trying. We were just kind of like, well, screw it. Nobody's listening. You got to get it. So we quit playing that gig. And when they call us, we just tell them we're not interested. And you say, how did you turn that kind of money? Well, okay. We all have good jobs. And we're a decent place in life, but a gig that sucks the energy out of you is a bad thing. And it does not further your career. You're not making any fans. And you could say, and we use this, Hey, it's paid practice. Somebody's paying us a thousand dollars of practice for three hours, but it's a little tough to generate the kind of energy you get when you're playing for people when there's nobody. Even at practices, there's songs that we practice enough to know them, but when we really hit the stride on them is when we play them live because we just lay it all out there. Some things that are also worth mentioning is at a Bardic, ask what the protocol is, and I join in. Politeness counts. Don't mistake politeness for weakness. I will get up and walk out of your Bardic, and I have. I've walked away from Bardic where people were seriously abusing the listeners. You know, I think if you're going to run a Bardic, you should set some rules. Hey, six minute time limit. I got an egg timer here. Don't make me boot you. And if you're going to make a rule, you got to enforce a rule. But I've seen Bardic's hijacked by somebody telling a 20 minute, totally inappropriate adult triple X rated story, a bunch of kids around 
and everybody's like, well, it's a bardic safe space and we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Okay, that's so far out of bounds. The only thing I could do is it's not my bardic, I'm out. And a whole bunch of people came and said, why are you leaving? And I said, because that, for one, 30 minutes takes up 10 people's three minute slots. Learn to be considerate, learn to be a good participant. Somebody's playing a song and they intro it and now you say, hey, I know that tune. Can I play along with you? And if they say no, you say, hey, sure, no problem. I'll just listen. Okay. You, it's not about you. Bardic isn't about you. It's about the audience and what you're going to try and convey to them. The single biggest thing you got to have to be, I'm going to say you need to have, if you want to seriously be a bard of any caliber, whether it's professional or not, and okay, so let's just make it real quick. If you get paid to do a thing, you're a professional. You get paid to pick up the trash, you're a professional. You get paid to play music, you're a professional. You get paid to wash cars, you're a professional. Professionals get paid. Amateurs, they might get paid. More often than not, they probably don't, or they take it out in trade or some non-monetary thing that is not something that supports your hobby directly. So you've got to have a thick skin, a really thick skin. My band and I had played at the same pub in Dayton for 10 years. We packed that place. We drew in big crowds and we could hold people who had come in, didn't know we were playing and they would stay and they would drink. Because at the end of the day, what I think about when I charge, when, when, when my fiddler and I, we set up what we charge for gigs. Most of our bar gigs are about 500 bucks. Some are a little lower, some are a little higher. St. Patty's Day, 800, 1,000 bucks. Nobody even, nobody even asks. We just said 1,000 bucks is what we want for that three hour spot. And they're like, fine because there are so few bands that do our music for St. Patty's Day, they're all fighting. So after a particularly big show, the next day I called to book a few more gigs and the guy who was running it said, well, we're not gonna book you anymore. I think you suck. You don't draw any people. You're not very good. We're done with you. Huh. Well, okay, what are you gonna do? It's not like you can argue with the ownership of an establishment, it's their place. So we quit playing there and our friends all, why aren't you playing there anymore? I said, they don't, they think we suck. They don't want us. What? I said, take it up with them. Go on their Facebook page, go in and talk to the bar manager. Why isn't Fintan here? So five ish, six years, five or six years later, I got a call from the owner, not the bar manager, the owner. And I, I, uh, I sent it to voicemail. I was like, I'm not talking to these people, not after being treated like that. And Countess Tamara, our bass player, who had been a musician busking and such all her life, said, shut your ego down, buddy. Let's talk to them. So I returned the call, and the owner said, hey, we got rid of that guy. I didn't realize, you know, I haven't been involved with the business much. I turned it over to him to run. He's a partner, and he screwed it all up. Will you please come back and play? So I said, okay, well, why don't we have a meeting? We're gonna come to the pub and let's sit down and talk about it. So we went and sat down and I said, look, here's our gig fee. We will take less money because we wanna eat. We don't put alcohol on the bar tab, but we want dinner and we don't wanna be nickel and dimed if it's $102 that you take $2 off our fee or something stupid like that. Our fee, the way I think of it is, is how many Guinnesses is that? <laughs> how many pints of beer? 450 a pint or five or whatever. How many does the bar have to sell to justify as being there? And I can tell you that at five bucks a pint, it's 100. It's more like 150 to 200, roughly speaking. Margin on alcohol is way higher than margin on food. That's all stuff you can learn when you're a band. And if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But the point is, get your ego out of it, get a big thick skin. I mean, it hurt our feelings. You suck, yet we're playing everywhere. We can't play the demand for us. Okay, so. Our philosophy is always one door closes and one door opens, off we go, we'll play somewhere else. And when you want us, you can't have us. Well, and that's a stupid way to do it. So we, we went and sat down with them and well, figured out what happened. And now we play there regularly. We're booked there three times this year. And I think we're going to miss our show in May, sadly. And I think we're all still going to be in this situation. But thick skin. And some people are going to be mean to you. That's the nature of people. A lot of people are, they're just shitty. But there are also a lot of people who will give you an honest critique and you gotta, you have to hear it. 
You have to listen. You can't just pay lip service to, yeah, I want to hear it and then not change anything. Band music is an evolution. I shudder to think what I must have sounded like in year one or two. Embarrassing. And four years into playing, I recorded an album with a, a bunch of, Scott, uh, of SCA musicians. We recorded an album of non-SCA music under our label Eccentric. We recorded an album in 92 and 96. And we still get requests for copies of those on CD or digital. And they hold up because we put a ton of work into it. And we evolve. And you keep moving onwards. Let me say a couple of things about, so for you vocalists, I want to show you another trick. This is actually for all musicians. If you're not familiar with this product, it's called Clear Voice. This is hands down, singing, speaking, whatever, church, I, whatever you're doing. This is the best stuff for your voice. You can get it at most music stores. Uh, our local place in Fairborn carries it, but I know the big box stores carry it. Do yourself a favor and get some of this. It will restore your voice. The other thing that works uh, extremely well, and I don't have any down here, is to take some water bottles and put a couple of tea bags of something called throat coat tea. You can order it from Amazon. If you have a, an herbal place, like we have a place called Health Foods Unlimited, I'm sure you're familiar with it, a place like that, you know, they cater to vegetarians and vegans and uh, celiacs and all that, and they carry all this stuff. They sell throat coat tea. You just take a couple at the night, you know, you, like, so this is what we do at Penzik. We take a whole flat of water bottles, we hang a tea bag in it, close the lid and leave them in overnight. And then we pull those out and take them with us. Beer doesn't help your voice. Alcohol in most cases doesn't help your voice. Soda in most cases doesn't help your voice. Milk helps my voice and all the people who are classically trained musicians go, ah, ah, uh, smooths everything out, get that phlegm going. But I don't do that too much anymore. Clear voice, get a bottle. There's one in my case and it's good. And even if you're just doing stuff like heralding, in the SCA, you keep this around. This is, this is Count Williams' magic secret here. And uh, I just think it's a great product. I will tell you the, uh, which one is this? Oh, this is the strawberry lemonade. It's kind of terrible. The cherry apple is good. The lemon is, yeah, but you're not using it for the taste. Um, I think this is pretty terrible. Oh, yeah. But I don't care, it works. You can already hear a difference in my voice. Um, and you spray it, if you're not familiar with how to do this, up and back and hit the top back of your throat. For everybody who plays an instrument, the amount of money you spend on your instrument has little or nothing to do with your performance. Yeah, I see Rosalind Jahan, right? If you're enjoying yourself on stage, the audience will enjoy it. Absolutely. Oh, what's, what's in it? Heck, I don't know. Oh, man, it's... Uh, I'm sure if you look it up on Amazon, I'll tell you what's in it. I don't honestly know. This is one of those guitar player things. I do believe it has like um, the marshmallow root. That's one of the things, the slippery elm. But check it out. <laughs> Sometimes Irish whiskey works. <laughs> well, if you're going to drink something, I, uh, I have a lovely Wars Optimer 10 year porter. A little something sweet. Um, but yeah, you have trouble controlling your face. That's from, let me see here. I just, I'm looking in the chat. Let me finish this thought and I'll, I'll scroll back through. Um, for you musicians, do not go spend $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 on a guitar. One, your first instrument, Yamaha makes, Fender makes, you can go to any music store and probably find a, a guitar with a gig bag and a tuner and some strings and a strap for 120, 130 bucks. Or my thing I always tell people is go to your local pawn shop. They have a ton of instruments, find a decent guitar, you know, look, uh, look straight down the neck, make sure the neck is straight, make sure that it's not warped. If you can, I don't know if you can see it here, the distance between the strings and the fretboard is called the action. You want it to be low. If you can stick your pinky finger under there, that's no good. Or if the neck is bowed, uh, 
This is a 1979 Ovation Balladeer, Dan Peacock. Just thought I'd mention that this is my Ovation Balladeer that I got for 400 bucks on Facebook. Original guitar, it's in fabulous shape. But learned to- I hate you, William. I hate you. <laughs> but I say it in a good Christian way, man. I know you do. I love you, brother. But don't go out and spend a million bucks on a music instrument. It, it, if you don't know, the number of people I've known who bought really nice guitars and then let them sit in closets because it was tough on their fingers. You're gonna play steel string guitar, so you have some volume, it's gonna be tough on your fingers. That is just life. Um, and I know that the camera's probably not good enough to see any of this, but I have permanent subdermal calluses that when the top skin wears away, the under callus remains. That's what you're shooting for. And a trick that somebody showed me was that you can use your thumbnail to kind of squish into your finger pads, into the tips of your fingers, help toughen them up. There's no, there's nothing better than playing. If you have a minute to play your guitar, grip, master, and any of that stuff, forget it. Tommy Emanuel, and if you don't know who he is, go look him up on YouTube. He's probably one of the top acoustic guitar players alive on planet Earth. Was interviewed, and he said, they, they asked him about all these mechanical contrivances for supposedly making you a better guitar player. And he says, I have something that makes me a better guitar player. Oh, look, it's a guitar. Why would I work a grip for five minutes when I could work on this for five minutes? And five minutes is something. Practice your instrument five minutes a day, your voice five, practice five minutes a day. I try and get all my students for fighting to do this. Go hit the Pell for five minutes a day. I'm not asking you to spend an hour, <laughs> you have five minutes. And hey, if you get 10 minutes, great. Five minutes a day, I'll give you one day out of seven, six days. You'll be stunned at the amount of improvement you make. And then the other thing is you can learn about the instrument and what you really want. Guitars sound wildly different. You know, go to your local music store after you've been playing a little while and don't get so, I mean, you should not for any starting instrument spend more than $400 under any circumstance. You just, you should not. Um, I have, uh, oh, it's not down here, it's upstairs. It's actually, it sits next to my desk and I use it to work on it. It's my original 12 string. It's an Alvarez that I paid $299 for in, 1989 or 1990. And the six string that I take around all the time is a nice mid-range, about a $600 Alvarez. It's my ska guitar. My wife bought it for me as a birthday present. And then I have three guitars that are over $1,000 that are my pro play guitars. Those are my gig guitars. They are uh, what I use for recording. They're really nice. But you can find nice instruments. Like I said, I found this guitar on Facebook. And, you know, you got to hunt around. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of places to look for, for instruments, your local pawn shop. And find, if you got a friend who plays guitar, get him to go with you. But set a budget and buy something that just gets you playing. And then if you want some help later, I wrote a whole article, which I believe I put in Ska Bardic Arts on buying your first guitar or buying your first stringed instrument and what to look for and all that kind of stuff. Because I see a lot of people spend a lot of money on instruments that don't get played, and that's sad. Um, the most expensive guitar I have was uh, about 1500 bucks. I went up to the greatest guitar store in the whole country is in Rochester, New York. It's the Rochester House of Guitars. They got like 2000 guitars, 2500 guitars on their showroom floor. And then they have another 3000 guitars in their warehouse. If you can't find a guitar you like there and they wheel and deal, there are a bunch of musicians, uh, but Find it, get to get started. You can find nice kits on Amazon or from your local music stores for ukuleles for less than dollars. I bought my wife a wonderful little pineapple uke that she plays all the time. And the whole kit, the uke, a tuner, strings, strap, gig bag was $90. You know, don't spend a lot of money. The, the, what I always tell people is they're like, well, why don't you have a Yari or a handmade guitar or a Zager or or man, if I could have, I'd, I'd have Seagull or I'd have Breedlove make me one or Froggy Bottom in Chicago, sort of about six Gs, right? And I said, I don't play well enough to generate a difference and you don't hear well enough to know the difference. You know, Andy McKee, yeah, he's got a, he's got a $15,000 spread Fred Colewood guitar. It's, I'm envious of it. If you don't know who Andy McKee is, you can look him up on YouTube. He's amazing guitar, but that's his whole life. That's all he does. He makes a living playing guitar. Well, okay. 
he spent on a guitar what most of us spend on a vehicle. That makes total sense. You need something to do your job. So um, is there anything left? Okay. The SCA will let you be a bad bard. Don't be a bad bard. The audiences will not typically be mean to you. And even when you're incredibly rude. And so I had an experience. Uh, we were playing at the request of, of the prince and princess of the principality, myself and my squire, Connor McClellan. And we played a song that's very well known and unknown to us because we don't follow SCA music. It's been filthed about a billion times. So we were playing a set. We opened with it at the princess's request. And literally before the last of the chord on my guitar had rung, somebody stood up and said, well, I wrote a response to that song and they just started singing. And we were like, okay, well, we'll let them get it out of their system. Before that person finished, another person said, well, I wrote a response to that response. And now the crown has this sort of pained look because uh, having been, you can't tell these people to stop, sadly, not really. You'll wreck them and that's not what we're trying to do. And so my squire and I politely bowed and we walked out and they continued doing filks of filks of filks of filks. I don't have a problem with that, but the first thing about it was the first person in that chain was incredibly rude. They didn't ask you to play. The crown didn't ask you to play. Inserting yourself into bardic situations where you've not been invited is a real problem. Oh, yeah. and, and so don't be that person. Learn some and, and, you know, get with other bards. Learn from other people. I spent probably five years of not playing a whole lot where I sat with great bards and I watched them and I watched how they played and I looked at the songs they played and I watched how they fingered the guitar and what did they, what were they playing? You can learn a lot. There's a lot of folks. There's a lot of folks out there who will be happy to help you. Um, I worked in a machine shop when I was, when I first started playing guitar in the uh, late eighties and I had an hour at lunch and I didn't, you know, I was nah, 22, you know, I'd eat lunch, you get a soda out of a machine, a bag of chips. So I started bringing my guitar to work. And there were four or five guitar players there who then started bringing theirs and we would sit around and I was nothing. I, I could barely make chords and they were all pros. But man, I learned a lot. If you open up your brain and open up your mind to the opportunity and, and of what's out there, you can get better a lot faster. You know, learn chords on the guitar, learn to play them. If you're singing, learn to sing a song consistently. Start with something small. You know, the biggest thing that Fintan did was at the beginning, we start every single practice that we have as a band by working on an acapella piece. To sing an acapella is scary. But if you do it a bunch, it's not scary anymore. And so by changing our practice habits, we were able to, one, we got a lot better as singers because when there's five, when there's six of you singing and no instruments to cover up your flats and sharps, there's nowhere to hide. So, you know, you got to learn to do it. But we picked relatively easy songs and we just worked them and worked them and worked them. And some of those songs, we probably worked on them for months till we got them to the point where we could perform them. And then we put some of them on albums. So, you know, um, some artists that have great stuff like that, certainly most people in the SA probably know Barrett's Privateers by Stan Rogers. But another song by Stan Rogers is called Rolling Down to Old Maui. And it's just a darn good sailing song. Some songs you can work on. Go find some. There's lots of great, you know, if you, uh, you, you really, you really want to, you know, challenge yourself, go out and look at what bands are doing acapella and, and pick a piece, pull out some old Steel Ice Fan. That'll, that'll give you something to work on. If you don't know who Steel Ice Fan is, go look them up. Big sort of, I don't know, uh, progressive medieval, something like, so progressive period medieval would be Steel Ice Fan, although a lot of it is almost like prog rock. And then Tempest on the West Coast is my prog rock band that I love that does Celtic style music and other stuff. But they do some acapella stuff that's cool as well. So I see that uh, Nico posted their library loans guitars and other instruments. I know that the Waynesville Library actually teaches uh, ukulele on Sundays. And there are also a ton of jams you can probably find if you look around. Uh, living in Fairborn, there are two youth jams in Yellow Springs, which is 10 minutes away. There's two or three in Dayton. There's a couple south. My wife troops to a few of them. You know, 
understand if it's a uke jam, it means uke. So they don't want you to bring your guitar. If it's an open jam, you can bring whatever you want. You know, sometimes you just go and listen. Don't take anything. Go observe. You know, we run a hoot nanny in our house once uh, once quarter. We play hits of the Pan Alley, 50s, 60s, 70s, rock, pop, funk, you name it. We've got a bunch of easy songs. We've got our own song book. It's got about 100 songs in it. And everybody comes in at every level, bringing whatever instruments they want to bring. We get harmonicas and ukes and cajones and tambourines, guitars, fiddles, you name it, bass. And we all play because nothing will help you be a better bard like repetition. So I think I've pretty well covered everything that, that I really wanted. Bonus topic. This is something that a lot of people either don't understand well or don't realize they can do. So you, you really want to do that Barry White piece, but you're firmly a high tenor or a soprano. So you can, there are two ways you can take a song and move it into your vocal range. So for a good example, the key of G and C are, are low for me. They're right around the bottom of my range. My range. I don't have a lot of bottom end. I got a pretty good top end, but I have a lot of bottom. I'm like that middle tenor if, I, if, I'm, if I'm honest. So you can transpose a song. So if the song is in key of C, and here's all the notes. And in guitar, you'll have what's called a lead sheet. It's words and chords. And if you know the tune, you can piece together what it's supposed to sound like. You change that C to a D and you move every chord up a step, making the song higher. Or you go down a step. It's too high for you. Take it down. Modifying, that's totally okay. You need to put the song where you can sing it. Struggling hopelessly to sing Stephen Stills' range in a Crosby, Stills, and Nash song is a fail. There are only a few rare humans that can hit that range. And I know a few, but it sure as heck isn't me. So you change the key of the song, realizing that the relationship of the notes will maintain the same, but as you play on guitar, it, it will sound different. The other thing you can do, this is for all you guitar and you players, you can get yourself one of these. This is called a capo. And I'm just going to, I want to demonstrate this for you. So this is my, uh, this is a Yamaha Transacoustic. It's got a little speaker inside of it, and it lets you put a little reverb and delay and uh, chorus in without the need for amplification. Now, it's an electric acoustic, so I can plug it in, and it sounds like a dream. But um, this is a nice guitar, 750 bucks, really well made, and great sound. But what I just want to kind of show you is, if I was to play a song, but I don't fall over, because I didn't bring my guitar strap. As I was going over the farm and carrying mountains, too low. Hey, look at this. I, can, I don't even have to learn some new chords. I'm just going to capo it up one full step. As I was going over the farm and carrying mountains, I can use this tool so I don't have to learn any new chords for the song. Now, one thing you have to know about instruments is if you capo crazy high, the guitar can get a little tinny, and it may or may not, whenever you put that capo on, you need to tune again. I don't have to generally tune on two. This guitar has pretty solid cover up at five frets. Play a D chord on a guitar, you'll know if it's in or out. It's not pretty good. That is transposition by literally shortening the strings of an instrument. And it works. Um, don't be afraid of changing a song a little. If you are struggling with a song, or if something in the song doesn't make sense, a word, and there are lots of songs like that, you can change it. Now, I might not change the words to Hotel California because somebody's really gonna. And I might not add my own, well, this song needed another verse. There are some songs that are kind of sacred cows, probably not a good idea. But the song Blowing, Blowing in the Wind, I'm sorry, not Blowing in the Wind, uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door by Bob Dylan, only has two or three verses. 
you can easily add as many verses to that song as you want just to make it a little longer to play it. Um, you have to remember that a lot of songs in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s were two and a half minutes. A White Sport Coat, which we played on our live stream Wednesday night by, Mar by the legendary Marty Robbins, is, two, is not, it's barely two minutes. It's that short of a song because it was built for radio play. You know, when that's why when Inagata De Vida came out, everybody was, oh my God, they, they made a song that's only two, they made an album that's two songs. And later, Pink Floyd made an album that's one song. Wish You Were Here is essentially one long continuous song. It has different songs in it, but it's really one piece. So don't be afraid to change the song up a little. And if it's a folk tune, or if it's an Irish tune, if you want to get learning some songs that are easy to find good recordings of on YouTube or on iTunes or wherever. Irish songs from the 1850s, what we, what we would consider to be modern pub music, are a great place to cut your teeth. All right, I'm going to stop talking and I am going to open it up to questions. The floor is open. You can unmute your mic and uh, if you've got a question, please feel free to ask it. And I, you don't have to pull any punches. Just ask a question if you like. Well, I got a question for you, William. Um, you mentioned about, you know, you know, when you were ta uh, talking about being emotional and, you know, letting the tears flow. How do you get past the, the you know, for lack of a better term, that, you know, you get it all choked up? Uh, what, 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 you know, the, you know, be, me being a good Dutchman, I, I wear them right here, right? You know, they're you. on my sleeve. Um, so how, how, how do I get past that? So some things you can do. Um, yeah, I just want to see, uh, Rosalind. Yeah, exactly. We put the starting note on a song. If you're doing acapella, put a start, use your pitch pipe, find your note or a piano and put your, put your note on the sheet. That's how we do it. Good, very good suggestion. Um, so one of the things, Dan, is practice it a million times. Um, we did Wish You Were Here in the set Wednesday last night, and I was thinking about Baron Rogalic. And it chokes me up to even talk about it. And uh, I got, I, but the other thing is take deep breaths so that your lungs are very full and sing for a short period of time and then deep breath again. And I don't mean to, to sing louder. I mean, like, you could, as you let your air out, the emotion is likelier to come. So, okay. how I wish, how I wish you were here. How I wish, how I wish you were here. We're just too lost. So, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was still, you know, um, my squire, Connor McClellan, does a song called Seamus and Ivy about two children that are killed in a car bombing in Northern Iowa. And then after he's done playing it, we all go out and sleep on the railroad tracks, hoping for the next coming train. But his comment was, you just got to do it. You got to play that song over and 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 over again. And when I'm playing by myself, I let it all out. You know, it, the tears can be running down my head. I'd be a little bit crying, sobbing, playing some songs. Um, until you're numb. <laughs> Fizby, yeah. Maybe not numb. I don't ever want to lose the feeling for that song, but maybe where I have a little better handle on it, where I've let that emotion, that overfill of emotion out. You know, we had a, for those of you who don't live in the Middle Kingdom, uh, Master Baron Rokala the Strong. Uh, yeah, comfortably numb. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can't get that wall of sound uh, Gilmore thing going on. Uh, but we do it in the hoot group though, but thinking about Baron Rokalik, he passed away. He had cancer. It, he came through the surgery and the treatment's all good and some complication and he was gone. And I, I, this guy was 76 years old, still fighting in crown tournament, an absolute hero, an absolute, absolute hero. And I, I had just, because I was traveling to central Illinois for work every two weeks, I just fought him in fight practice a month ago, right before he went in for surgery. And Wish You Were Here was a really hard song to sing. And it's a little hard to even talk about it. But you can work through it. You just have to play it a bunch. Okay. Health to the company has been on saying at too many funerals. <laughs> and that's really, you just, I mean, you, there's, there's still emotion there toward the end of it. But oh, yeah. repetition, repetition, repetition. 
Parting Glass is my bane of my existence. I hate the song to begin with, but it gets requested so much. I don't like the Parting Glass. It's too melancholy for me. Health to the Company at least isn't melancholy, but yeah, that's another Big Waterworks kind of song. I sang uh, for my father's funeral, and I practiced it at home a few times, and there were always a couple of lines that I just would boo-hoo. So when I sang for the funeral, when I got to those two lines, I concentrated on my diction and where I was going to take a breath and how many syllables it had and damn near anything to get my mind off of what I was actually singing. And I got through those two lines and then the rest of it, you know, I was sad, obviously, but it didn't choke me up, you know, like, like uh, you were saying. So if yeah. you really always have one spot, figure out something else to concentrate on. Since you've been emotional for the rest of it, I don't think my audience noticed that that particular line was <laughs> extremely well enunciated. <laughs> but at least I got through it without breaking into tears. I don't awesome know if that'll help or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's a great suggestion. And I, I find sometimes too, like as you're singing a song that has some deep meaning to you as a person, it's like you're pushing the rock up the hill. If you can just get to the top of the hill and let the rock go and get past that point. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a great way to do it. Focus on I'm gonna what what's the next word? What's the next word? Where am I going to breathe? And mm -hmm. make it a technical exercise. Uh -huh. That's yeah. a yeah. Just, yeah. just for that one little piece. My father was a big Broadway fan, and his favorite song was to dream the impossible oh, dream God. from um, uh, Man of La Mancha. Yeah. And, and it's kind of a, you know, real SCA, tough, you know, kind of song anyway. And uh, the circumstances were, were really tough for me to sing. But, no, of course. Of but course. that worked. I don't think my diction has ever been quite so good for anything else <laughs> I've ever sung. And there are there are many ways, and part of your your journey as a bard should be to be introspective a little bit, to find those things about how it works for you, what works for me. You know, uh, as an example, so a gentleman who won a bunch of crown tourneys in our kingdom, his method was. He would go to, he would get in a corner of the site and get a wall of squires around him and he would put on some Wagner and he would read the Book of Five Rings and somebody come and get him for a fight. He'd, he'd go all the way out, he'd take his stuff off, hand it to one of the squires, put his stuff on, drop the hammer, go back to the corner. And he asked me to coach him for one of those crowns and I thought, well, you've won two crowns already. Well, you need me because because he says, because, well, you, you won't take any of my shit. But I, we made the wall of squires and people came up and they said, we just want to talk to him for a minute. I said, I'm sorry, you, you can't. Well, but I, I'm, I'm Duke so Are you the king or the queen? Then you don't get to talk to him. But I know somebody else tried that exact method and it failed them spectacularly. As a bard, you got to find what's your groove. What's your jam? What's your thing? You know, for me, I love people. I love playing for people. I love when people get a smile, when they tap their toes, when you can get that curmudgeon who's sitting in the corner and then you play. We, we played one year, we were cruising around Penzik and we went to a camp that was notedly hostile to bards. Um, and, and, they, and they said, we hate bards. And, and if we don't like what you're playing, we'll kick you out. And, All right, we'll, we'll chance it. And so we opened up with Johnny Jump Up. And I mean, short of you being dead, that will get your foot tapping. And then, they, we played three or four, we played three more songs and they were begging us to play more and we broke our cardinal rule. We didn't stop playing it three songs. So seven songs in, Master Luce, there's a first year Master Luce and I came back to Penzik War. We played 30 camps in six nights and we couldn't even speak. We destroyed ourselves in the cool evening air. Wear a scarf, kids. Yes, it looks dumb. Get a hood, get something like this. Put something around your throat, have your clear voice. Uh, but, you know, we love doing that. We love connecting with people. We love playing some song. And when somebody says, well, play, play a Pink Floyd song, 
we'll play Wish You Were Here or we'll play Comfortably Numb. And it connects to the audience and they love it and you're making that experience for them. There's two kinds of people that really make moments in the SCA. Queens, or by extension, princesses, and bards. Yeah, there's other kind of moments, but by and large, those are where queens and bards. And so find what your jam is. Find what you like. Play songs you like. Other questions? We still got a little bit of time. My time is your time. A lot of folks on this. They've had a pretty good crowd. A few folks have dropped, but, uh, I mean, if there's Hi, anything, Williams. and if there's, go ahead. Hey, it's Maggie. Hey. Uh, hey, I was wondering if you could tell us what was your absolute best experience playing and what was your absolute worst experience playing? Okay, uh, what was my best experience playing? Uh, man, that's the first time, the first time we won an audience with Fintan was probably it. We played a festival. We were a kind of a local band and we followed a band and the tent stayed kind of full. We were in between two big draw bands and we owned the spot and we sold 300 CDs in one hour. That was amazing. That was a real experience. It changed what I thought about performing. Worst experience playing doesn't necessarily mean worst experience to the audience. Um, the playing at the Green Dragon down at Gulf was the worst bardic piece because I couldn't hear myself and I was convinced that I sounded terrible. And next time I will bring some earbuds and a little something so I can hear myself. But they do this pass the hat for money for the bards and I, I went down and I was terribly dejected. I thought the Prince of the Middle Kingdom, and I was Prince, just went out and made a complete and total fool out of himself. And it was a Ziploc gallon bag bursting with money. And everybody was like, wow, we haven't heard any of those songs in a long time. Man, you were great. And I'm like, pure muscle memory and repetition let me get through that because it was miserable for me as a bard. But again, it's okay if it's miserable for me at some level. The audience really liked it. And everybody was thrilled. And I just took my bag of money and donated it to the Green Dragon because I'm not in the SCA to play money or compete against anybody. I get paid real money out in the real world with the music. That was a really unpleasant experience. And part of it was my lack of preparation. That's on me. But wrote ability, let me get through the show. I don't have too many, you know, bad experiences. Uh, you know, the occasional, I mean, on St. Patty's Day, you, you know, you can have some, you can see some things playing St. Patty's Day gigs in big tents and large pubs that, sort of defy uh <laughs> rational society you know even even getting flashed by girls is just after 18 years of that it's like whatever it's the drunken stupid belligerent people that you really gotta watch out for we've had some st patty's gigs that kind of sucked you know uh but i would say that per that performance was apparently good and everybody loved it so it's okay but for me personally and like i said i hope to go back to gulf wars and i'm gonna play at the green dragon again but i'm gonna be better prepared. Does that answer your question? It does, although I thought maybe you were going to say your best was that one that I keep seeing the picture of. You share it every time it rolls around when you played it at, what was it, the Guinness Brewery? In oh, <laughs> that was, a. Uh, so we went over to Ireland and we contacted a Guinness at St. James Gate to play in the Gravity Bar at the top of the Guinness Storehouse. And we were there on a Sunday, so we flew overnight Saturday. We've been up for 30 hours. I've been up. I can't sleep on planes because I have a CPAP. Can't plug it in anywhere. You can't take the batteries on the plane. They won't let you. Um, not in the carry-on. So anyways, we are ragged out but they, they're ready for us. They're like, hey, great, you know, do your thing and then meet up in the gravity bar in two hours. Here's, can you store your instruments here? All great, we're all, it's dawn of the dead because we've been up for, and we've been touring all day. So we land, tour, all over the place, come back to Guinness. We get up there and it is a crush of people. The gravity bar is a circular bar that's glass all the way around. And it's just, it's big and it's just, mobbed with people and they have velvet roped off a space for us and we're just going to do some acoustic songs we're going to do like 
two, three songs for our fans, say, ooh, we played at Guinness. So the crowd is off the charts. So we opened up with Johnny Jump Up, which falls, I'm sorry, we opened up with Tell Me Ma and the Ten Penny Bit Jig, which gave us a fiddle piece. And the crowd goes friggin' crazy. And they start sending over trays of uh, glasses of Guinness. And uh, we do a song called Sean Ryan's Polka, which is just, it's a, we started slow. It's a, a polka, it's an Irish polka. And we just play it faster and faster and faster to an insane level. And the crowd, we spent an hour playing. And the crowd finally started to thin a little bit. We finished off with P for Patty. That was a pretty amazing experience. Yeah. That, was, that was an amazing experience. I don't know if it was our best performance. You know, we're playing in that space and, you know, we're acoustic. We don't have any amps. It's just us. So that was a great experience, though. Yeah, I always post that picture. The one we're jumping in the air, that's Sean Ryan's polka, where we, everybody, the fiddler, Karen, our lead singer and the guitar player, we all jump off the ground and we keep playing uh, the song. So it's fantastic. I, I love hearing you tell about that because it makes me feel like I was there. And maybe sometime I will be. I want to go to Ireland with you guys next time. 2021, uh, maybe. And we're, we're hoping. Okay. Yeah. The tour is up. I mean, the tour is up on Prime Tours if you want to go look. Um, but it's for April 2021. Other questions? Um, will you may, I, if I may, Your Excellency? You may. Why, thank you. So I did, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but um, I did the, the theater major thing, and I spent about five years doing the professional actor gig, like actually working, um, a lot of regional theaters, things like that, and um, very much an actor who sings rather than a singer who acts, and you know, the difference is huge. Um, I have been hesitant, you know, there's always been that kind of draw to, to do Bardic within the SCA, but I can sing a song as a, or sell a song as a character, yeah, I'm, but doing so as myself singing a song, hmm, not so confident. So I was wondering if there were, was like a, um, where should I probably look, knowing within that, that skill set, what would be a good place to start? Well, you know, uh, again, uh, again. sorry. Somebody have something to add? Okay, so one of the great bardics I ever attended, I was there with uh, Mistress Halla. She's a show tunes girl. And the song that probably got the best response at the bardic, she did Rainbow Connection of all songs. <laughs> awesome. a Acapella and just crushed it. Owned the place. Not a dry eye in the house. And she smashed it. And she also followed that up with Kiss at the End of the Rainbow. So it has a lot to do with where you're barding. I mean, really, understanding the space. Um, but there's nothing wrong with show tunes. You know, like um, Una and Stasi and um, Hala and Hiades, they're all theater people. And one of the times we were sitting at a crown tourney, we were up in the front lobby uh, way too late at night singing show tunes. Because it's okay. I mean, again, I, I think you could do anything you want. Uh, if you want to look at some easy songs, I always recommend Irish tunes that you probably know a lot of them anyways. You ought to talk to Halla. Talk okay. To All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Trisby, Thisby, Thisby, thanks for joining us. Uh, I may do more of these. If, if you have interest, we can always, uh, there's, we could do a course on talking about nothing but how to book gigs or how to build set lists. We could do a whole hour just of that. Yeah, I Anybody would like to hear about set lists. Set lists? Mm -hmm. I would be very interested on set lists and building out shows and all that. Well, sure. Um, let me talk to uh, Master Andreas, or soon to be Master Andreas, and see if there's any slots. Uh, yeah, that's a whole thing, and uh, how to build albums. Um, I just do what Reynard, I'm told. Reynard and Baldrain, thanks so much. Oh, from the Outlands, thanks so much. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay tuned. Uh, uh, yes, please, on the list. Okay. Uh, then the public has spoken. I'd probably join that class, but generally I just do what I'm told because, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you may have some, you know, you may be barding by yourself and how to construct a set list and how to also construct an album is uh, if you want to record your music. And we could even discuss a little bit on some recording stuff. I do a lot of recording now. And oh, I have yeah. built the studio in the house. Uh, I have yeah. a space now. 
Is it still upstairs? And yeah, still? yeah, but it's all rearranged now. It's so much nicer. Oh, so nice. It's so much nicer. Dipping my toes into the recording thing, I'd be interested in hearing on recording too. Or maybe I'll maybe I'll go hit Master Phil around the head and shoulders. He has a whole class he used to teach at Penzik on how to get into basic recording for the SCA Bard, and a lot of common mis you know mistakes I see people make. Um, you know, there was this lovely couple that used to come to the Ren Fair. They may still be there. I don't know. We quit going, but they were called Lost in Time. T H Y M E. Kind of clever, and uh, he would lay on the ground on his back and play the guitar like at her feet. But they just, they didn't, you know, if your guitar is pointing up in the air, kind of a clever idea, kind of cute, maybe for rent fair, but guess what? Yes, you have to be heard. It's things like that, little easy mistakes. So um, I will look at putting together another, another class. So I will ensure that I post it out. And Barry, I'll talk to Andres. I think Ohio's in lockdown until the end of April. So I'm sure I can find a spot. Um, are Thursday nights good for people? If there are better nights, drop, drop a note in. I was trying to put it on a night. I, I figure Friday nights, even if you're in, in lockdown, are probably pretty. I'd have to check my social calendar to see all these places I'm going. But um, yeah, probably pretty much any night would work now. <laughs> okay. There are, um, Andreas, there's probably three or four slots left in April. I am going to be discussing with uh, the chancellor uh, in about a week opening up for May because I think I really know what's going to happen here, right? So May is probably on the table. Andreas, uh, if there's an open spot left in April somewhere, <clears throat> sure, put me into it and I'll put together a class around uh, set lists, tempoing, and maybe a little bit of recording. I'll put together a class. Find me a spot. It doesn't have to be right now. Any, uh, any last questions before we close this down? I'm glad I asked for an hour and a half. I mean, my basic class for that's an hour and face-to-face -face, people are often more, more likely to talk, but uh, I appreciate the input from everybody. And uh, if there's nothing else, then I believe this has been recorded. It will go up into the Middle Kingdom Rum channel on YouTube. As soon yeah. as I send it in, just send me the release and I'll sign it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, yeah. Um, I'm from Atlantia. If anyone else is and you want to get credit at the University of Atlantia, there's a little form you fill out and, and we can get credit for uh, the rum classes. Nice. I'm from Atlantia. Hey, got lots of friends there. So nice that you joined us tonight, Rosalind. I have a daughter there. <laughs> Who's your daughter? Okay. Uh, Lashir. Allie. This year. Not sure I know her, but that's okay. That's okay. All right. Well, folks, you all please stay safe and uh, thank you so much for taking my class. Have a good night. Thank you, William. Thanks, Bye. William. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye.